Come on, church family, stand to your feet. From the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out and lifted me up. Yeah. <laughs> 
grateful for his love. It's a love that changes things. It's strong and it's secure. It's hopeful. And we stand on it today. I'm going to invite you to take a seat. I'd love for you to point your attention to the screen. Hey, Exchange family. We're excited to be worshiping together today. And we're grateful that you've taken time to join in what God is doing through the Exchange. Our mission is to see people exchange old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. And we pray that you are challenged today towards next steps in your faith. If you're new to the Exchange, whether in person or online, we'd love a chance to connect with you. If you're new to us, text CONNECT to 601-397-6111. And if you're in person, be sure to stop by the New Here kiosk outside to receive a free gift. If you're online, let us know you're new and we'll mail you a free gift. Whether you are new or a consistent part of our faith family, texting CONNECT to 601-397-6111 gives you access to more information about what God is doing in our church family and connects you to next steps in your faith journey, like info about baptism or to share your prayer needs with our staff team. Next steps are huge, and we believe you aren't meant to do life alone. We'd love to encourage you towards next steps of joining a life group. Whatever your situation and schedule, there's a group option that's available for you men, women, couples, and young adults. You can visit our website for more information about groups, times, and locations. We also wanted to take a moment to say thank you. Your generosity in this season has been incredible. You have helped the exchange to bless individuals, businesses, ministries, and churches in our city and around the world. Through your faithfulness to give, you are showing your dependence and trust in God as provider, and he has never failed. If you're ready to give today, you can do that through multiple safe and secure digital platforms like text to give or the Church Center app. Or you can give cash and check in the white box located at the exit doors. Today, we'll continue to sing about our desperate need and desire for Jesus and open God's Word to explore how life is better when we're connected to the Savior as we continue our Better Together series. So will you stand with us as we continue to direct our gaze to the one who changes everything?
When I'm just going through the motions, I'm sorry. When I just sing another song, take me back to where we start. Now open up my heart to you. But I'm sorry. Take me back to where we started Open up my heart to you Caught up in your presence But I just want to see you at your feet Caught up in this room That is the cry of this house. Lord, that above all else, we just want you. Not our agenda, not our opinion, but you. And in ourselves, we don't have the answers, but we know the answer. And our hope, and our trust, and our faith, and our perseverance, and our character is wrapped up in the finished work of Jesus on a cross. It's amazing what happens when we shift our focus. 
high to the heavens rather than to the world around us. Everything in our vicinity begins to shrink away, to silence and still at the majesty and the power and the beauty and the glory of the one who made us in his image. And so God, we ask right now as we step back into what is home for us, God, home is when we're our most real. Home is when we are our most open. God, we ask right now while we are open, God, that you would speak. God, let us rest our feet on words of faith, on words of truth, so that then we can carry the gospel to a world that desperately needs it. God, you are calm in the midst of chaos. You are steady in the midst of struggle. God, you are good. And we rest in that promise today. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray today. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Church, you guys can grab a seat. 10 o'clock, is it good to be together? Woo! Come on, man. There is, uh, man, there is no place like home, all right? There's no place like home, and man, this earth is not our home, but we as a spiritual family love to call 417 North Beardman right now in this season the good homey place to gather, right? And so, man, welcome in today. We're so excited to be back in our building together, so I say welcome to you, but I also say a massive welcome to all of you joining us as a part of our online family today. Uh, you're in your living room, your bedroom, you still got your PJs on, all right, or you're in your workplace. I mean, you're a part of our family together today, and I just want to say, uh, man, because I've had a chance to walk with these people, and I'm watching them even as you're singing earlier, we have an incredible team of people who are working behind the scenes so that you can still be a part of our family here in the room today. So we're just one big old family, all right, gathered all across uh, together today. And man, it is good to be together. Hey, last week as we gathered for our very first uh, time in person in three months on a, uh, on a mildly warm football field, uh, man, we ran across a theme, we, we gathered around a theme that we said we are better when we are together. We're better when we are together. You see, if this, uh, man, if this social distance, uh, man, uh, quarantine season has taught us anything, it's taught us that we are better when we are physically together. All right? And I know some of you are still working your way back in if you're watching online today, but we're, we're better when we're physically together. God designed us to walk and to be together with one another. And in this past season, we just had like this tangible in-your-face reminder um, of our deep need to be together, to be with one another, that we strengthen, we encourage, we challenge one another when we're together. So today we're continuing um, a series of talks across the month of June called Better Together. Better together. So if you have a copy of Scripture, we're going to be there today. John 15 is where we're going to be. John 15, if you're in the room or watching online, man, pull out your Bible out, pull out your Bible. John 15 is where we'll be. We're going to put verses up um, here in the room, also online for you guys to follow along. Uh, but John 15 is going to paint a powerful picture about being better together. Now, here's where we're going today. Track along with me. Today, um, I want us to see that we, we are better when we are together. And right now, if you're in the room, you're experiencing the physical presence of that. But here's what I want us to all see today, is that we are only better together as a spiritual family when we are living personally together with Jesus. Okay, if you're taking notes, that's what goes at the top of the page right there, all right? We, we are better together when we are together as a spiritual family, no doubt. But we are only better as a spiritual family when we are personally together with Jesus. You see, God designed us to share life together. That's why we call ourselves a big spiritual family. But he also said you are first to find your life and your relationship and your identity in me, to be together with me. And I would state this point today, church, that our strength as a spiritual family, as a seven and a half, almost eight-year-old church, is not in how big our building is, all right? It's not in how deep our bank account can get. 
It's not even in the number of people who show up to our building in a COVID world, pre-COVID world, post-COVID world. All right? That's not where our strength is found. Where our strength is found is in how passionately we are personally pursuing Jesus. You see, we're only better together when we are personally together with Jesus. And so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to open up John 15. We're going to look at verses 4 through 8 ultimately, but here's where I want to start. We're going to go verses 4 and 5. Jesus gives a little teaching. He gives a little warning. And then after that, we're going to end with some application. I'm going to give you three things that you can do in your life every day, starting tomorrow, okay, to remain together and connected with Jesus. So read with me um, online here in the room, John 15, verse 4. This is what Jesus writes, okay? Not John, but Jesus writes this. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And if you remain in me and I in you, then you're going to bear much fruit. But here it is, apart from me, okay, when you're not together with me, you can do nothing. Now, Jesus begins this passage um, with this three-word command. What did he say? Remain in me. Now, this word remain, I think most everybody knows the definition of remain. We get the idea. It means to abide, to, to stay put, to live continually in something, to dwell at that one place. We get that. And so Jesus says, remain, abide, stay put, dwell in me. But I think it's important for us to not miss this. In order for us to remain somewhere, we have to be there first. In order for us to remain somewhere, we got to be there first, okay? You can't remain somewhere if you've never been there. And here's what I'm saying. Could it be that some of us are trying to remain in Christ? You could even hear what I'm going to say today and go, well, I got I to gotta remain in Christ. But you've never really been there first. You can't remain somewhere that you've never been. See, one of the greatest tragedies of our culture is this. It's when people believe they are living, they're remaining in relationship with Jesus, only to find out they've just been walking in religion. And our culture, man, we, it's so easy for us in the good little Bible Belt to get these two things mixed up. Let me give you some examples. Religion says, try harder, do more. All right? Relationship says, trust more. Religion says, I got to go to church. Relationship says, no, 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 no. I, ga I gather, but I live as the church every day. That's who I am. I, ca I can't escape that identity. Religion says, man, I, I got to live my life to meet a certain standard of morality. I got to kind of be better than, than most. Relationship says, I, like, I'm, I'm incapable of meeting a standard of morality. Therefore, I'm desperate for Jesus to make me whole. You see, religion and relationship are so different. Let me, let me give it to you this way. Some of you, this is your language, okay? I read a statement this week that said this. Religion is a guy in church thinking about fishing. But relationship is a guy out fishing thinking about God. Hello, that's somebody's language right there. Listen to me. Jesus did not call us to religion, but he says, man, I call you to a relationship where I'm not a segment of your life. But I'm in every part. It's a relationship, and you never leave it. it. It ain't an hour on Sundays or when you tune in online. Like, it's who you are. And here's what Jesus actually says to the religious crowd, to the stuffy church people. Here's what he says. Listen, Matthew 15, verse 8. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their what? Their hearts are far from me. Don't miss this. In religion, we can be really close to the things of God, even at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Hello. We can be really close to the things of God, but still be completely missing God. And Jesus says, no, you're better together with me. Jesus says in John 15, remain in me. But the only way you can remain is you got to get there first, right? And listen to me. Here's the beautiful part of that. Jesus doesn't make it hard. In fact, he does all the hard work. Scripture says, how, how, do you, how do you get to Jesus? It's not attend your way there. 
It's not strive your way there, earn your way there, pay your way there. No, he says it's, it's, it's trust your way there. It's go like, man, Jesus, like I'm, I'm jacked up. I ain't, I ain't all put together. I'm not perfect. And therefore, that means that I can't fix me. But you can. And so, Jesus, I need, I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I need your love. And I'm trusting you, not me. I'm trusting you, not the church. I'm trusting you to make me whole and new in you. And he says, that's how you get to me. So therefore, you can remain in me. You see, you can't remain somewhere that you've never been to first. And the only way to be better together with Jesus is if we choose relationship. We walk in relationship with him. But Jesus goes on in verse 4. I mean, he gives us this warning. Read it from your copy of Scripture. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself, but it must remain in the vine. Now, if you've read John 15, studied it before, you understand Jesus' illustration. He was saying that he's the vine, we're the branches. He's the life-giving source. We are connected to him. When the branch is connected to the vine, it finds life. All right? A few months back at my house, we decided to purchase some indoor plants, okay? We were like, man, we need a little life up in this place, okay? And so we decided we'd go get some indoor plants. Now, let me preface it by saying this. My wife and I, in our time together, have killed and executed many more plants than we have ever helped live and thrive, okay? So that's just who we are. But I don't know what had happened. I guess months had gone by. We kind of, like, blocked our memory out from all the, you know, deceased plants that had come through. And we were like, we're up for the challenge again. Let's do this thing. And so we went, got some plants. My wife got them, put them in all around the house, okay? And so then, like, we began to ask others, well, how often do you water your indoor plants? Like, yours have been alive for, like, three weeks. Like, that's, that's a good track record. Ours is not good. How do we do this? And so we got advice. And so I kind of got dubbed the, the indoor plant waterer guy, okay? Like, that's, it's just yes, ma'am. That's what it does. And so I said, I'll do it. So, I man, I'm on this watering schedule. Like, I'm not missing, not too much, not too little. Like, I'm on it. I'm on it. But something started going wrong. Like, the, the plants that were started green, they start, like, the leaves start turning brown, and they start shriveling up and dying. And I'm like, babe, you got bad plants. Like, it's not me. It's not you. Clearly, you went to the wrong store. These must have been the manager's special. They was about to die anyway. It ain't me. It's got to be the plants. And so, then we asked somebody who's way smarter than me when it comes to plants, which is not hard. And so they said, well, listen, did, have you been fertilizing them? And I was like, uh, no. no nope, nobody told me I had to fertilize my indoor plants. Now, listen, some of you who were born with a green thumb, okay, you're just so special. We're grateful that you're here. Okay, listen, listen, you're judging me right now, and I don't know who you are, but God knows. And so I'm just saying you need to lay down your judgment. All right. This is what we're working with. Okay, this is who we were. So listen, what happened was I started fertilizing. I bought some fertilizer, started fertilizing. And guess what happened? Hello, the, the leaves turned green again. Like they're thriving. They're like smiling back at me. Man, we've been waiting on this. Here's the thing. I was watering. I wasn't missing the schedule. I was on schedule. But I wasn't giving them the nutrients that they needed to live and thrive. Don't miss this, church. You can go through all the church emotions, but you can still be missing Jesus, who is the life behind it all. And maybe this is where some of you are today. I mean, you, you can own a Bible. You can show up to the regathering of the post-COVID church. You can pray when you get in trouble. You can say all the right Jesus things at your workplace, but you can still be living life not connected to Jesus, who is the life behind it all. And he says, when the branch is not connected to me, you know what it won't do? It won't bear fruit. And the goal of the life of following Jesus is to be a fruit producer. It's, to, it's called to bear fruit. The goal isn't just being, but it's producing. And you know the only way that you produce is if you remain. You have to stay connected. And Jesus says you are only better together when you are personally together with me. You're personally together with me. So let me ask you this question, all right? Flip the script to you. What does the fruit of your life look like? If Jesus says, connect to me, and then you bear fruit, don't connect to me, and you don't bear fruit, what does the fruit of your life look like? Like for you, tomorrow, Monday, in your household, in your marriage, in your family, at your workplace, whatever your social setting, like, like what fruit is just coming out of your life that looks more like Jesus? Like, like in your relationships, in how you go to work, and how you love your kids, and how you respect your parents, does it just look more and more like Jesus? Because listen to me. The produce of your life is directly tied to the connection 
of your life? And if I just threw that question out, I was like, hey, what does your fruit look like? Some of you are like, mm, I'm glad I'm not having to answer that question out loud. Like, I don't know if anything's looking like Jesus. Do you, know, do you know how you track down the problem? You go find the connection source of your life. What am I most connected to? What's filling me up most? Because Jesus says, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain connected together with me. That's what he says. Now, he rephrases this same truth from verse 4 in verse 5. Look back with me, John 15, verse 5. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I'm in you, then you're going to bear much fruit. But, don't miss the warning, but apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus really in verse 5, he's just further clarifying what he said in verse 4. He's like, I don't, I don't know that you fully got it, so I'm just going to say it a little bit different in verse 5 to see if you got it. But I love that Jesus makes this statement. Did you catch it? He says, he says I am. I am divine. Jesus is divine. And as I read that this week, I thought, why, why do you think Jesus had to emphasize that he's divine? Like, don't, doesn't he think we, that we got, we got the illustration, Jesus? You're divine. We're the branches. We got it, okay? Could it be that he clarified that he is divine, that he is the life source, because he knew how easy it would be for us to slip into the mindset that we are the vine? That we're the life source? See, one of the most dangerous places that we can ever walk into spiritually is to a place of, of spiritual self-dependence, a place of spiritual independence. Like, do I have any parents of teenagers who, who have ever been teenagers are up in the room? Does anybody get me on that? Okay. Like, I don't, I don't know what the official day is, but I got one at my house. I don't know what the official age is. It's almost just like a flip, a, a switch flips, just like that, where mom and dad know everything. To like, boom, mom and dad know, like they don't, they don't know anything, okay? Listen to me, teenagers, I ain't hating on you, I did it to my mom and dad too, okay? But there, there, so in life, there is this place where, yes, you should become a little bit more and more independent. But look, watch this, spiritually, it's so different. Spiritually, as a follower of Jesus, you recognize that I'm always dependent on Jesus. Like apart from him, his word says, I can do nothing. And Jesus calls us to be together, not just like one another, but together with him. But watch this. But our default so many times as humanity is, is to drift to isolation. This is what we do. Like we, we drift to isolation. We've all found ourselves. You lying if you don't say you have. We've all found ourselves in that place where we're, uh, we're smart enough or uh, we're experienced enough. I've been through a lot. Or we're, we're strong enough, man, I'll persevere. Or, or we're, we're financially stable enough, and we're like, I think I'm good. I, I don't need a lot of help right now. Now, now listen, we don't, we, we'd never say that out loud, Ooh, but we think it and act like it, don't we? All of a sudden, like, my, my personal time with Jesus starts kind of dropping on the priority. Little Jesus, like, I got a lot I'm doing. Like, I'll get to you. Or we find reasons why, like, man, I can't make it on Sunday. I don't know if I can serve, right? Or, or we stop praying. It's like, God, I, I know you're there. I think you're listening. We're going to talk tomorrow, I promise. And without even realizing it, we drift into this place of self-dependence and isolation when Jesus says, no, 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 no. We were, we're better together. Man, we're better when we're walking in this together. And what I've found, I don't know about you, but I'll be real. What I've found is that when I drift into that place of self-dependence, of isolation, you know what Jesus will do? He'll, like, he'll start rocking the, the boat of my life just a little bit. And sometimes a lot of bit, all right? If you're feeling me? To wake me up and get my attention. And I don't know, but perhaps some of you maybe watching online today or in the room, like, maybe that's where you are. And maybe you're not feeling it right now, but it may be Monday morning at 8 a.m. And God's going, God's going to shake some circumstances, some situations of your life because you've been living in this place of like, man, I think I'm all right. I'll push through. I'll be good. I'll man up. I'll woman up. Listen. And Jesus says, listen, no, 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 no. You're apart from me. You can do nothing. But when we're together, that's the way I designed it. Man, we're better when we walk in this thing together. We are, we are better together when we're personally when we start there we're personally together with jesus so what does that look like we got jesus teaching we got his warning what does it look like man we're living in 2020 in a covid world all sorts of stuff happening across the world. like what does it look like for you and me to remain together with jesus here's where we transition from the teaching and the warning to here's i'm about to give you three things to just like plug in 
press play this afternoon, tomorrow in your life so that you can remain together with Jesus. Okay, so we're, we're going to look at the next few verses of John chapter 15. Let's pick up in verse 6. Here's what it says. Jesus says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Kind of sounds like some branches that have happened in my house, okay? You're thrown away and it withers. Such branches, those branches are picked up, and here's what happens. They are thrown into the fire, and they're burned. Now, here's the way we're going to word this first one, okay? This is the first way that you and I remain. We're together. We remain together with Jesus is this. We recognize the reality of life without Christ. Recognize the reality of life without Christ. Christ. You see, if this, if this season of like social distance, all that kind of spread out, if that's taught us anything, man, it is like, it's taught us how much we miss some very simple everyday things of life. Has it not? Okay, like whether it's like sports on TV or eating inside of a restaurant or like going to work or getting your hair did, which some of you still haven't caught up on that, I can see, okay? But like all these little simple everyday things we, listen, we've, we've missed them. Why? Because we, we've realized what life is like without them. And in the same way, but on a, oh, so much grander scale, Jesus says, man, it's good for you to recognize the reality of what life is or would be like without me. If you were apart from me, Jesus is making an analogy in verse 6 about the branch that withers in the fire. He's pointing to the reality of an eternal place without him called hell. And, and Scripture man, teaches us a lot of things about hell, but a few things is that it's a place of fire, it's a place of torment, but you know what's the worst thing about it? It's absent of God. Like that, it's, it's absent of God eternally. It's the eternal consequence of a life without not, to, not together with Christ. There's no redos, no rewinds, no mulligans. Like, like it's the eternal consequence. And Jesus says, listen, you, you're better when you're together with me. So let me ask you this question. Like, do you ever have moments in your life as a husband, as a, as a daughter, as a son, as a grandparent, do you ever have moments where you reflect on what life would be like or what life was like when you were not together with Jesus? Like, I, it may sound weird, but I, th I think it's a healthy practice every once in a while to think about the old us. If you are the new you and you're, you're trying to remain and stay connected, like, every once in a while, it's good to look back and think, not to go like, I want to go there, but to say, like, oh, man, Jesus, you saved me from a long way away. Or from some of us, it's like, man, I grew up in church. I was, I was the stuffy church person, and I, I was near to you, but you still saved me. And thank you, God, that I'm not who I once was. Because I think when we do that, watch this, when we do that and we look back to see where we are, it should increase our love and our passion and our gratitude to Jesus for what he's done. And so how do, how do you remain connected together with Jesus? And put it into practice in your life that every once in a while, maybe as you worship, right, as you read your Bible, every once in a while, man, we, I look back on where I was, and I recognize what the reality of life without Christ would be like, and I long for him more deeply. Now, verse 7 gives us a second truth, second application. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Here's the second application I'm giving you today on how do you remain together with Jesus is this. Realize the promises of God and live in them. you got to get the whole statement. Don't get half of it. You'll miss it. Realize the promises of God and live in them. Okay, Jesus says, if you remain in me, you can know the truth of my promises. He says, as you spend time in my word, as you worship, as you follow, as you obey, you'll learn these promises that I have for the life that remains, and you can live in them. Now, about four years ago, uh, my parents took my family, uh, my kids, my wife and I, to Disney World. Now, I'd been like one time before, but it was like 20 years before, and I was wearing like tall white socks and umbros in sixth grade, and so it was really bad. I like don't want to look back at the pictures, and so I was like, we got to have something new and updated, and so we're taking the kids now, and so it was fun, 
But one of the things my, my parents um, purchased as part of our trip package was the Disney meal plan. Anybody familiar with the Disney meal plan? All right, anybody? Yeah, okay, awesome. All the broke people. And they're like, yeah, we did it, all right? And we ate there. If you're not, like, if you haven't been to Disney World, it's all good. The Disney meal plan, basically, you pay ahead of time so that you can walk up to the different restaurants in the parks and you can just eat. You just show up like, I'm hungry. And they're like, here we go. And so you, you purchase it ahead of time. And so there's, like, quick service meals and that's where you get like a sandwich or burger, something probably quick for lunch. And then you got like the full service or the table service meals. And that's where it's like we sit down. Like you come take my order, okay? And it's got like a little expanded menu. It's got the good stuff like the meat and the vegetables and all that. And so and then my, my parents purchased a meal plan where we had, I think we had like one quick service and one full service meal um, for a number of days. So we line up all these restaurants that everybody had recommended and we're like, we're eating there. Don't even know what they serve, but some, you know, mom said it's good. So we're going there. And so we showed up and I'll never forget, like I can picture it right now, sitting down the very first night at the first like full service meal. Like we did the little sandwich for lunch, but this is like the, the big deal. And so the waiter comes in, pass out the menus, and my parents look at all of us and they said, hey, listen, order whatever you want because it's already paid for. Now listen, I have to preface it with this. This is coming from a guy who never walks into a restaurant and orders the most expensive thing on the menu, okay? Like, I normally don't even order in the top five. That just ain't how I roll. Maybe that's how you roll. We love you. We're grateful you're here. But that just ain't how I roll. So in this moment, I've got the invitation. I'm in Mickey's house, and the invitation is order whatever you want. It's covered, all right? Your boy had steak and ribs all week long, all right? And I was like, I don't even care about Mickey Mouse, man. Mickey, your food is phenomenal, man. Space Mountain what? Like, come on. This is a ribeye right here in front of me. And so, like, I, I, I enjoyed it all week long. Now, listen to me. Don't get lost in the illustration and miss the truth. When I came to realize the promises of the meal plan, I spent all week living in them. Catch this. There are some of us today who say, man, I'm saved, redeemed, covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm a child of his. I'm new in him. But yet you're failing to live in the promises of the God who has saved you and made these things available to you. Case in point, Romans 8 says God loves you unconditionally and beyond measure. Yet some of you wake up and you go, man, I don't even know if I feel loved by anybody. And you chase love in so many other different ways and places other than Jesus who scripture says he is love. Or we could go here. How about scripture says in Matthew 28, it promises Jesus' last words on earth. He says, I will be with you always. If you're in me, I'm remaining in you. I'm with you always. Yet there's some of you who, who believe and live like you're all alone and like God doesn't care anymore. Or we could go with Psalm 139. How about that one where it says that God created you. He knit you together in your mother's womb from before you saw the light of day. He says, I put you together. I made you exactly like I wanted to make you, and I gave you a great purpose. But yet there's some of you who wake up and look in the mirror every single day, and you question, and you hate, and you doubt what you see in the mirror. Like God messed up on you. Or we could go James 5 where God says, man, call out to me in prayer. Call out to me in confidence. Not just that I'm, I'm here, but I'm listening and I'm answering. And no, it may not always look like exactly your request because I know your request ain't in line with my purposes. And my purposes are better than your request. But you can pray in confidence knowing that I'm listening. But yet some of us wake up every day and go, I got nobody to talk to. And I think God's lost touch with my story. And what I'm saying to you today, church, is that if you are in Christ, you're on the full service meal plan of a good and faithful and perfect and loving father but it's up to you to live in the promises by being in the word by declaring it through song by memorizing it here and here so that when you live it out you're going like no 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 i am loved no no no, no. i know what the world says but i'm just like god wants me to be you see, if you want to stay better together with Jesus, it means realizing the promises of God and living in them. We stay better together with Jesus by doing what? Recognize the reality of life without him. Realizing the promises of God and not just, I know them, but I'm, I'm living in them. And then catch this one, verse 8, final verse of our passage today, John 15, verse 8. This is, this is to my Father's glory, Jesus says, that you, that you would bear much fruit, 
showing yourselves to be my disciples. Here's the final truth today for all my people writing it down at home in the room. We're better together with Jesus when we do this, when our lives reflect the character of Christ. When our lives reflect the character of Christ. Like when we wake up as this just like increasing mirror of Christ, that our life is looking more and more like him. Jesus says the way that God is most glorified in us and the way that we are most together with him is by bearing much fruit with our life. Verse 8 says when we produce fruit, so Jesus said right there, when we produce fruit, we, we prove ourselves to be his disciples. We can say the proof's in the pudding and the proof's in the fruit. And Jesus repeats what he really said earlier in the passage. He says, the goal of your life is not just to be, but it's to produce. It's to bear fruit. Now, some of you, you're going like, what you talking about with fruit, man? Like, I like bananas and apples, but not really grapes, okay? That ain't what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying that your life, if you're, if you're together with him, if you're remaining in him, all right, it should be bearing fruit. Now, we, I think we could think about fruit in two different ways, okay? There's, there's personal fruit and there's public fruit. Personal fruit and public fruit. Stay with me. Personal fruit, we could say, is kind of like what Paul says in Galatians 5. You ever heard it before? You sung the song at Vacation Bible School, the fruit of the Spirit. He says if you're in Christ, then your life should be producing these things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So you should be coming, all right? You should be becoming, as you follow Jesus, more fruity, all right? So if, you, if you've been following Jesus for five years, you should be a little more fruity than you were in year one. If you look the same as you did in year one, you better check that connection source. Right? If you've been following Jesus for 35 years, you should be a lot more fruity than you were in year one. If you look the same, something's wrong. There's no personal fruit growing. And Jesus says, hey, if you're apart from me, then there's no fruit. And so, like, we got to go, like, am I apart or am I together? So there's personal fruit, but don't miss this. I think we could also say there's public fruit. And here's what I mean by that. Public fruit is what happens out of our life as we love and serve and demonstrate Jesus to those around us. It's the neighbor it's the coworker that you'll see tomorrow morning. It's the classmate, the teammate, the other parent on your kid's ball team. And it's your responsibility as a follower of Jesus to love them, pray for them, serve them, and reflect the character of Christ to them so that through the power of God's Spirit, they might be drawn closer to Jesus. And ultimately, guess what? They, bec- they become the fruit of your life. So there's personal fruit and there's public fruit. And I believe that every follower of Jesus, like if we're really in, is producing personal fruit and public fruit. Now, now catch this. Some of us, all my church people, listen. Some of us, we get really, really, really focused on the inward personal fruit. Got to grow me. Got to go more, learn more, learn more. Let's, let's. We forget there's a call to public fruit. If you get in life, you should be squeezed out into a place of giving it to Now, there are others, don't miss this, there are others who spend so much time investing in the public fruit of giving, investing, pour out, pour out, pour out, that you can miss that God starts the public fruit in a place of personal fruit first, where he grows you so that you got something to squeeze out. I believe the full follower of Jesus has got the personal fruit and the public fruit. How how could you have both? Because you're remaining together with Jesus. And he's growing both of those things in your life. And you're reflecting the character of Christ continually. It's increasing in my life. See, church, no, we ain't gonna lie. It's, it's good to be together. It's good to be physically together at home. And we could all agree that we are, we are better when we are together. But can I challenge us today? We are only better together when we're personally, you, me, when we're personally together with Jesus. And the measure of the impact of this spiritual house is not in our building, it's not in our bank account, 
It's not in our number of people, but it's in how passionately are you and me personally pursuing and being together with Jesus. So here's the question. What will you do, okay, today, beyond this moment, in this season, to be together with Jesus so that we can be better together as a family? Let me pray for us. God, thank you. I mean, it's just, it's not only good to be together, but it's just good to be in your truth. And God, you're just, you're a perfect dad. You're a great teacher. And um, you, you speak challenge, but at the same time, you speak encouragement and hope and life. And um, I think that's what makes you a great father. And so, Lord, today I pray that we would not miss it, that we wouldn't just hear it today and go, all right, we got back and we heard the message. But, God, it would, like, it would change us. We'd look different. And, church, I believe there's some of you, man, in the room today, some of you watching from your couch right now. And listen to me. You, man, you, you're a follower of Jesus. You love him. You want to serve him with your life. But listen, he got all up in your business today. When he told you that maybe you're not remaining, you're not abiding. Maybe you've reached this season where you, you become a little self-sufficient in your faith. And perhaps right now he used today or he's using some other things in your life just to shake your, your lifeboat a little bit so that you, you would realize that apart from him, you can do nothing. So right now, like as you're just reflecting on truth, still locked in to go, God, what does this mean for me? For some of you today, listen, it means like you just need to pick up your Bible again. Like God goes, it's a, it's a living, active book that you don't read, but it reads you. And God's calling you, man, just to spend five minutes in his word, one chapter, ten verses, and let that truth sink in, water the, the, your soul with the truth of his word. For some of you, that's it. For some of you, man, it's like you need to be connected with somebody else. You can walk up in a gathering of this many people or watch online, and you can still be all alone in your spiritual life. And listen to me, you can't do it alone. Jesus said that. So maybe today you need to drop a wall or an excuse and you need to connect with another brother, another sister, a group, a relationship where you can be real and you can grow with somebody else. Or for some of you, maybe it's just reconnecting by just talking to your dad every day. Like God says, I'm listening, James 5. Would you, would you pray? Would you call out in confidence? Like I, I know what the marriage looks like. I know what you're struggling with. Why don't you talk to me about it? And for some of you, man, that's starting two minutes, like two minutes tomorrow. You just, just pray. God, I, I'm not putting you off to tomorrow. I'm, I'm putting you off. I'm putting you right now. You become the prior. I want to talk to you. And for some of you, it's, it's remaining. It's choosing to abide in him. Now, listen to me. For some of you online or in the room, for some of you, this is you. Remember, you, you can't remain somewhere if you've never been there. And maybe today, as we spoke earlier, maybe God got up in your business today about you've been living in this like just choosing religion, trying to earn your way, love your way back to God, or maybe, maybe you've been so far from God because you've been, you've been chasing so many things of the world, and, and Jesus today says, listen, man, don't, don't be apart from me, because apart from me, you can do nothing, but with me, you find life. And so today, he's calling you just to that very simple confession to go, God, I'm broke. God, I, I'm, I'm messed up. God, I'm not perfect, and I can't fix it, but I need you too. And for some of you today, the greatest decision is on regathering day <laughs> to choose Jesus in a relationship with him. And listen, if you're in the room or in person, we, we don't expect you to process what God's saying by yourself. And so we've got a way today um, for you to respond and connect with people even right now, right now. For some of you, maybe you just message right there as you're watching online, or if you're online in your living room or in this room right here with me, would you just text your name? Um, to the number, you see a number on the screen behind me, put it in your phone, write it in your Bible. Um, maybe you text it right now or this evening or this week as you're spending time with God. God, what am I doing? God, I'm so disconnected from you. I'm living life for myself. Would you just text your name? And we would love to pray for you and encourage you. I'm um, just through a simple text message. God, today we need you desperately. And God, we just get real to say there's a lot of days we try to do it alone. And we act like we don't need you. And so God, today, would you not just give us another sermon, but God, would you give us an obedient challenge that you, you leave up to us. You said, if you remain. You're not a dictator, God, but you said, if you remain in me. And today, I pray that your people would choose and follow you with everything that we are. 
God, we love you. And thank you for speaking into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, church, it's good to be together. And man, I'm grateful for you. We love you. And I mean, our team is so encouraged by what God is doing in this season. I just want to brag on you to say, uh, man, what we just walked through in May in the middle of social distancing and gathering on a football field, man, you guys have been incredibly generous in this season. Had one of our most generous months in our church's history in the middle of a global pandemic because we're saying, God, we trust you. We trust you. We want to follow you. So, man, I just say thank you for all the ways that you're choosing to worship Jesus. All right? Man, let's keep it up. Let's continue to walk in that because we're better when we are together.